What chapter did you have to read for this week? Seven. So what comes after chapter 7? Okay, don't read chapter 8. What comes after chapter 8? Don't read chapter 9. How do you feel about that? Okay. Put your hand up if you like that. All right, good. I don't want you... I'll tell you what. If you read chapter 8 and chapter 9, I, you're going to forget it in a year's time anyway. So why do we waste your time making you read it, all right? What you need to take away from your class experience are key concepts, ideas, ideas that will be with you forever. The three-legged stool is a really critical idea, all right? And if one of those legs are out of balance, it falls over. Knowing that, that is a 10 times more valuable than memorizing things in chapter 8 and chapter 9. 7, 8, 9 are kind of like the three legs, all right? 7 is about decentralization. Chapter 8 is a bit more about measurement. But as you'll find next week, it's, it's only like a small part of measurement. It's only the financial part. Because the book is really focused a lot on the large organization that has the accounting system, the omnipotent accounting system that you can measure everything and have KPIs in accounting terms. So you have profit centers and cost centers and investment centers and then make people responsible for them. So you've got your measurement and then if they do very well they get the bonus. So then you've got your, your decentralization, you've got your measurement and then you've got your incentives. All right, there's your three-legged stool. That's what chapter seven, eight and nine is about. So if you want to read 8 and 9, please have a look at it, okay? But get the concept of the balance is most critical, okay? And know why when you miss out on one of these legs, what is the potential? What is the big problem? That's what you need to know, okay? How's that? So don't read chapter 8 and don't read chapter 9, okay? All right. I'd sooner you read something that you're interested in, okay? Uh, motivated, that motivates you. Understand why the balance is important, okay? Try and answer that question. Find an answer to that, in question, that question. And you'll be 10 times more uh, understanding of those, the contents. Okay, here's the thing. What we're going to do in the next half hour is we're going to, we've got the three legged stool, we did our decentralization, did measurement, did rewards. Uh, I'm reminding you that those chapters are focused on that financial dominance in the organization, the accounting dominance. Next week we're going to look at strategic responsibility centers. Wow, what do we mean by that? Don't scorecard. We're going to look at strategy. We're going to look at non-financial measurement. Okay, non-financial measurement as well as financial. Chapter eight focused dominantly, predominantly on financial measures, the budgets in the organisation, cost control, budget controls. Okay, but didn't talk much about non-financial measures. All right, so we're going to talk more about that with the balance scorecard. All right, the three-legged stool, one, two, and three. Any questions on that? James? Okay. Uh, well, for our question regarding the decent if you don't decentralize, is there a limitation problem as well? Limita well limitation from the boss. Uh, potentially, yes. That's a good question. Is there a limitation if you don't decentralize? So here, yeah, you might have out of control because of limitations, out of control because people were deliberately limited 
from doing what they can do rather than their personal limitations. Okay, yes, that's from that aspect, yes, you can talk about it from that aspect. Okay? And with centralized, yeah, definitely the direction is helped by having decentralization. The hard work is all the incentives is what failing when the stool f falls over, okay? And the idea is that this three-legged stool kind of represents a modern corporation that has the accounting system as the major measurement device, okay? So next week we're going to kick the stool away and look at other alternatives to that, okay? In looking at balance scorecard, non-financial measures in the organization. Okay. So keep in mind. Uh, so why why do I teach you this? Because in large organizations, people tend to the judgments of C managers, C level managers, tend to err on the side of the objective and reliable, which is basically accounting information. Uh, if you come to them with non-financial information, they may not pay as much attention to it. Okay? Because it's in there. They have limited knowledge. Uh, they have limited time to access all the information that's coming to them. They're going to focus on the stuff they think is reliable and objective. Even though non-financial information may be more specific, but they may be, it may be judged to be less reliable. Remember, what are the two big dimensions of measures? Sp specificity eh? and precision, which is reliability. All right? You see, we're coming back to that now. All right? And uh, in large organizations, C managers, it's in their best interest to actually focus on precision first. All right? They want to minimise their risk, they'll focus on precision before sp being specific. Very good. Let's move on because I want to, I want to skip over the PowerPoint and we want to go to, what's our final picture? Any more questions on that, by the way? What's our final picture? Alright, so we have Let's go to the four pictures again. We have a brain, we have a Ken Lay. All right, we're balancing those two things. Then find next picture we have the Citroen, the French Citroen that can drive with three wheels. Okay, and that is a good example of a car that can balance, a four wheel car, the only car and four wheel car in the world that can balance with three wheels. All right, as the concept is having balance, three-legged stool, balance. Balance, decentralization, measurement, incentives. Key idea, key learning for you is when you go home and you, pra and you want to revise what you're learning, you need to be able to answer the question, what if the decentralization leg is missing, what are the consequences? What if the measurement leg is missing, what are the consequences? What if the rewards leg is missing? What are the consequences? That's what you need to know. Is everyone clear about what you need to know on that? Great. All right. So it's not about memorizing everything in the PowerPoint slides. I'm just telling you what you need to know. All right. What you now need to know is we want to go on to the PowerPoint slides did cover revenue center, cost center, profit center, investment center. Great. It has a very much a what type of emphasis? A very much accounting emphasis, right? Very much financial emphasis. Okay, chapter 7, 8, 9 really focuses on the financial, highlights the financial. Before we get into chapter 10 and 11, that says, well, hang on, enough of that. It, look, we know the financials work, and we know GE has been the epitome or the perfect example of how uh, financial measures can work in the organization because managers were held accountable for KPIs according to the financial measurement system. But when we get to chapter 10 and chapter 11, then we say, oh, hang on, 
financial measures are limited. Okay, we need non-financial measures. We need a more balanced system of measurement. So we're going to talk about that next week. Okay, so next week we're going to kick the stool over to a little bit. Okay, but this week, just understand, there's a, there's a stool in most large modern organisations that needs to be balanced. Okay, that's what you need to know. Here are the centres of decentralisation. I can make you responsible for revenues, costs, profits, investments. I don't think you need to, be, to go over each of those areas. Here's the next thing I need you to know. We, here are the different managers involved in the organisation. And you can see that here are the different managers. Why do they show different managers? Because it's possible in one organisation to have an investment centre, a profit centre, a cost centre, a revenue centre. It's possible to have all different types. That happens. Okay, that happens. All right. So that's our stool. One, two, and three. Responsibility centres, chapter seven. Measurement, chapter eight. Rewards, chapter nine. Okay. But class, don't read. What? Yeah. yeah, it's all right. Okay. Just learn that other thing. Go back. If you want to study, revise everything, write a short essay on why one of the legs falls over, why it fails. Okay. Ex answer those questions. They're the big things you need to practice. Understand. Here's transfer pricing. All right. The last one. We are balance what? What are we balancing with transfer pricing quickly? We're balancing goal congruence, performance evaluation, incentives, and what are we, don't worry, this is not in your PowerPoint side. You don't need it. There's only four things you need to understand to balance. Just write them down. Of course, the, the part two PowerPoint sides are in IVLE, but it, don't worry. We just need to balance four things. You ready? You write them down now. Number one, you need to balance goal congruence. Number two, you need to balance performance evaluation, incentives, and autonomy. Class, here's the deal. 30%, maybe a little bit more, maybe a little bit less, of global transactions are conducted inside organizations between units where, what? Transfer pricing occurs. Transfer pricing makes up close to 30% of global trade transactions. 30%. What does that mean? That means transfer pricing is significant. Okay. All right, transfer pricing is significant. It is, you cannot go to an organisation and think, oh, they don't do transfer pricing. You must have an assumption that they're doing some. In organisations in more than one tax regime will have some transfer pricing issue. A lot of companies in Hong Kong are set up to have transfer pricing arrangement between their companies subsidiary or related organisation across the border. So then they can minimise their 30% plus tax in China and maximise their profits for their 16, 17% tax in Hong Kong. Okay, transfer pricing. Kelvin, 30% of trade, okay, different tax regimes. Do you think transfer pricing is important? Yeah, you're just saying that. All right, but thank you. All right. No, but I want you to believe it. I want you to believe it. Don't just say, oh, professor says it's important, it's important. Okay. Let me give you another fact, the reason why it's important. Every big four firm has a tra transfer pricing expert, if not partner. Uh, it's a constant challenge for multinationals to do, have the right transfer pricing arrangements. Not just for tax, but for these other reasons. 
proper goal congruence, performance evaluation, incentives, and autonomy. Okay? So think about that. They're the reason we're trying to balance these things, and also we've got tax issues in that. Okay. So here's your deal. We're going to do a transfer pricing exercise. Oh, by the way, let me give you a 30 minute instruction. 30 second instruction on the calculations for transfer pricing. There are two main economic reasons for transfer pricing for the way you calculate when you should do transfer pricing inside rather than external. When you should transfer goods internal rather than external. Number one, when you have excess capacity of one division and so you might as well use it, make the other division buy from that division at marginal cost rather than buy external, okay, so the whole company benefits, right, number one. Number two is when? To save sales and distribution costs. Because you transfer it internally, then you don't have to pay sales distribution agents, or you don't have to, etc. Okay, or the transferring division, division that's selling doesn't have to pay commission the salespeople to sell the goods because they're just transferring them internally. So those two things, they are two economic reasons for why that motivate internal transfers of goods. Okay, not to mention uh, the other things. So you're going to do a transfer now. There are cost-based transfer pricing, there's market-based transfer pricing, and a very common approach to transfer pricing, Charmaine, is negotiated transfer pricing. So you're going to do that now. Some of you are going to be a motor products division. Some of you are going to be a consumer products division. What are you making? You are making an ice cream maker. You know a big ice cream maker? Put all the ice cream in the thing and it, it, you know, got to stir it around and make it, right? So there's a motor to do that. Ryan, we don't just have you stirring the pot, okay? We have a motor doing that for us. All right, so we have an electric motor. Then we have the sorbet maker, which is like ice cream. This is the products division. They can choose to buy that motor externally. They can buy it from motor products. Motor products can choose to sell the motor to other consumer electronics companies, or they can choose to sell it to the other division. All right, so Weihan, Charmaine, Celine, Melissa, you are the motor products division. Get your pen and write down motor, w motor on your page now. Okay, Ryan, you're the consumer, consumer products. You four, you four are going to negotiate with this four. So you, you're consumer. You four, motor. All right, Ning Roy, Kelvin, Melody, Kelvin, uh, your. All right, consumer, no, motor, consumer. Motor, consumer. Right, Joel, you're with this for. Uh, motor, your motor, write down now, because I don't want you saying, oh, what are we? Okay, your motor. Okay, and you four are consumer. Okay, uh, you four are motor. Okay, you three are consumer. <coughs> Are we clear? Write that down now, because I don't want you to say, oh, what are we? Are we motor or consumer? Okay. Is, is everyone clear who they are? Next. Pay attention, please. We're going to be very quick. Consumer, you need to work out what is the lowest or the highest price that you are prepared to pay to motor products division so that you can make sure that you have a return on investment of 20% given that you have variable costs, fixed costs and operating assets and that's your selling price here. Okay? So you've got to work out the highest price you're going to pay the motor division. But of course you want to get something lower than that, right? Motor division, where are your motor, where's motor? Motor division, you need to work out you need to work out the minimum, the lowest price you're going to sell your motor for. Alright? So, it's going to be 
20% return on assets, 20% of 400,000 plus your fixed costs and you buy, you're selling 50,000 units so you divide that, find out your unit price, okay? This group, you have 50,000 units so you work out your total cost divided by 50,000 to get your unit price. You have 60 seconds, do the calculation, then you start negotiating. Calculations, then negotiate. <coughs> okay, we're in stop.